I'm going to be talking to you a little bit. Ooh. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about the reactor itself, uh, its history, how it works, and where we're going from here. It's nice to see all of your faces on the screen, those of you who have your cameras on, or uh, your names at least, or those of you who have your cameras off. Um, hopefully, sooner or later, we will be able to see you all here in person. Um, so with that, let me get jump right in uh, with some some history. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So our story begins here in 1952 at the Adams for Peace speech at the United Nations by Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, president of uh, the United States at the time, uh, initiated this, um, this push to be able to use nuclear or at the time atomic energy to do things for peaceful purposes as opposed to just using it for bombs. He wanted us to be able to share that scientific information with each other around the world and be able to use this new technology to do something that was better for humanity as opposed to just building bigger and bigger devices to destroy each other. This coincided with another very important event that happened at Penn State's campus that uh, doesn't immediately correspond, but you'll understand where it's going soon. And that's a coffee shop at the basement of the union building had just closed. And that coffee shop brought in a revenue, a profit, after it closed of about $250,000. So the deans and the presidents uh, all met at the time and decided or were trying to decide what to do with this $250,000. And the president of Penn State at the time happened to have the same last name as the president of the United States. Milton Eisenhower, younger brother of Ike, uh, was president of Penn State at the time. And when you're brother is the president of the country, you get really cool Christmas presents. So with this $250,000, they set ahead to build what would become the nuclear reactor here at Penn State. Construction started in 1953. Um, here in the next slide, I have a small snippet of a uh, promotional video that, um, that was broadcast throughout the 1950s. I don't know if any of you on the call right now might remember this. Here, for example, is the nuclear reactor at University Park, a combined research and training laboratory, as it looked during construction. From start to finish in less than a year, Penn State is like that and always has been on the move. So there in 1953, we began construction. Uh, the Building was completed in 1955 when uh, President Eisenhower came to deliver the commencement address. This is him, his brother Milton, to his left. Uh, to his right it is Dr. William Brazil, who designed our reactor, as well as the bulk shielding reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He was brought here by Eric Walker, who is on the just off screen, there he is, on the far right, who was the Dean of Engineering at the time. Brazil was brought here to design and build the uh, first uh, reactor on a, a college campus. We have license R2. License R1 was given to North Carolina State. However, North Carolina State had to scrap their original reactor and move it to a different part of the campus. When they did that, they had to apply for a new license. So our license R2 is the longest operating license in the United States, probably the world. Uh, in 1955, the technology was very young. It was only being used by militaries and governments. We were the first civilian uh, reactor to get up and get started. In this picture, you see Dwight Eisenhower to the far right. Of course, that's Eric Walker to his uh, <clears throat> to our left, Milton to his to our left again, and then to the far left on this screen is uh, Dr. William Brazil, who the facility is now named after. 
as it's legend, as the legend has it, I should say, uh, in 1955, Dwight came to tour the reactor, see this, uh, this facility that he had uh, approved to get built. He wanted to start the reactor. He was looking around saying, hey, I want to be the one to press the button. What button do I press? And here's uh, Milton pointing down at what would be the reactor core, except for we didn't have any fuel there when he came to visit. And the guys probably had a bit of a chuckle and they said, listen, you can't go down to the corner store and buy highly enriched uranium. We need the fuel to be get through Washington, all the paperwork to get pushed. Can you pull a few strings for us? And again, as legend has it, I was not here at the time. A few weeks later in the back of a pickup truck was the first delivery of nuclear fuel to Penn State University. I guess the president must have uh, cut a few red tape strings and got us our first core loading. Reactor would go critical later that summer for the first time in, 19, in 1955, in August of 1955. Um, here's another picture of one of the original pictures of the facility and um, just the reactor uh, bay itself. And here in this aerial photograph, over University Drive, you can see us in kind of the upper right-hand corner, that little metal box that is uh, far away from everything. Of course, since then, they've built the campus towards us. So now it seems like we're in the middle of the thick of things. Uh, but at the time, the only thing surrounding the reactor were turkey farms. Some of the old uh, reactor operators who remember those times would say they'd have to show up in the middle of the night because alarms were going off and they got uh, called in by the police and you'd have to trek through uh, yards and yards of uh, old uh, turkey uh, excrement to be able to uh, get through and up to the reactor building before they opened for the, for the morning. In 1955, we had a reactor called an MTR, or Materials Testing Reactor. The MTR type reactor had plated fuel, which you see in this picture, as opposed to the rotted fuel that you see um, more often uh, in these days. The reactor was fueled using highly enriched uranium. Uh, the fuel was in plates, uh, and we had a maximum operating thermal power of about 200 in 50 kilowatts. That reactor was here um, from 1955 to 1965 and contained uh, some beam ports were put in to use the neutrons in, uh, in those neutron beams. That's gonna be important uh, a little bit later on because I'm gonna tell you about what we're doing, what we have done recently and what we're going to be doing next with those beam ports. In 1955, they came and switched out the entire reactor core. Um, they have, uh, instead of having the plated style fuel, we now have rod style fuel. Uh, instead of highly enriched uranium, uh, they switched over to low enriched uranium. So the core that's in there now is from 1965. Uh, some of the fuel rods that are in the core today are still in there from 1965. I will now, if I can find this button. Here we are. So what I have for you here, and I don't know if it's really visible, is this is a scale model of our nuclear core. You can kind of see the top of it, I guess, at the bottom of the screen. But back here, this is a fuel rod that would go in into the nuclear core. This is a scale model, about one third scale. The full size is one of these. In the reactor, we have four control rods. There's one here in the back, one here in the front, and two off to the sides. The control rods are about twice as long as the fuel rod. So here we contain the reactor fuel, the uranium metal mixed with our zirconium hydride. 
cladded in stainless steel. Over here, we have the control. Control, to control this reactor, you need to control the amount of neutrons that are being generated inside the core. When the control rods are lined up with the fuel like this, and the top portions are lined up with where the fuel is, those control rods contain boron. Boron absorbs the neutrons, so they cannot go into the nuclear fuel, into the uranium atoms. As you take the boron out of the core, and you start to allow those neutrons to interact between fuel rods, the number of uranium atoms capturing neutrons is going to increase, and the number of fissions will increase as well. By increasing the amount of fissions, you can increase the amount of power that, is, that the core is being generated. I have in the marketplace from companies like an Amazon and many others. And so if you're not inflation sensitive, this is going to be serious pressure on earnings. So some of these reliable growth companies that have steady growth patterns are going to start to see those patterns. Get is there somebody on that's not needed here? The reality is with inflation, uh, habit is. Yep, there he is. All right. So let me share with you a video of a uh, reactor startup now. I had to take it out of the um, out of the presentation because it was too too big to show. So back to Zoom and share. All right. So if I did this correctly, you are now looking at a video of the control room. And I'm juggling with the camera just a little bit. So here, uh, CJ is our reactor operator. And what he's doing with his hand there is pulling out one of the, um, pulling out the control rods one by one. So right now we have the control rod that's on the far left. That's our transient rod. It's held up using air pressure, which is different than the other three rods, and that's why it's blue at the bottom. As you take out the borated control rod, the gray portion, uh, you allow the neutrons to interact with each other and they start to increase in power. On the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see our neutron population. So right now it's kind of steady. It's, you can see it kind of a little tick up at the end now that we're pulling the control rods out. Um, I'll zoom, fast forward ahead here as he takes the control rods out of the core. And then you can see on the right side of the screen or the right screen that those neutron population is starting to increase. So by increasing the distance out of the core those control rods are, you can increase the amount of neutrons generated in the core. And from that, you increase the amount of fissions that are happening. Every time a uranium atom splits, you get about 200 mega electron volts out of each reaction of thermal energy. To put that into context, burning one molecule of coal gets you about one electron volt of thermal energy. So splitting one atom gets you 200 million times that because we're harnessing the energy from the center of the nucleus as opposed to the energy of the bonds of the electrons. So the energy that holds the nucleus together um, is much greater than the energy that holds atoms together. So here we are at a steady state. We call this criticality, which means that we're not going up in power or going down in power, but the reactor is operating at a steady state and that's critical. Um, we can change the rod motions or the distance of the rods out of the core to either go up in power and go down in power. And that's what we're going to do next. I'll fast forward ahead. So from about 100 watts, we're going to about 50 watts. There's three lines on the right side of the screen. Two of them are in log form, and then one of them is in linear. So you can see that the increase in power happens exponentially.
and pulling up a video of the core itself during that startup, we can see exactly what's going on inside of there. Let's see, here it is. Oh, I need to share my screen. My fault. And here it is. So you might have seen this before. It's been picked up by a few different um, media outlets. This is a picture of the core, our old, with our old D2O tank behind it as the reactor is starting up. So again, what's gonna happen is we're gonna take those control rods out of the core. I'll fast forward ahead just a bit. And what happens is that you start to see a blue glow coming from that. The blue glow that you see in the reactor core happens because there is particles, little bits of atoms that are moving faster than the speed of light in water. So I'm sure you've all heard that the speed of light is the uh, ultimate speed limit of nature. You can't, nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Well, nothing can move faster than the speed of light in the vacuum of space. Speed of light changes if you're in a different medium. So if you're at the pool this summer and you stick your arm about halfway in to the water, you can see that it looks like uh, your arm has been cut off and it's, uh, it bends a little bit in the water because the light is actually moving slower through water than it is through air. And because that light moves a little bit slower through water than it does through a vacuum, we can surpass the speed of light in water, still obeying all the laws of nature. When that happens, there's something similar to a sonic boom that happens, um, only with light waves instead of sound waves. And it jumbles the electrons in the uh, in the atoms that are surrounding the reactor or inside the core, just enough so that it gives off a shock wave of energy that just happens to be in the visible spectrum. So the higher in power we get to, and I'll fast forward ahead again, uh, the brighter that blue glow, glow gets. So here we are at one megawatt, our ultimate, our um, highest steady state power. And that reactor is glowing much brighter than it was um, when it was at a lower power. You might be seeing the, uh, the words here on the screen are talking about a little about the bubbles. You can see that there are bubbles coming from there, but most of that isn't from boiling, even though the reactor fuel at a megawatt is a little bit over 500 degrees Celsius. There's enough water in the core or enough water in the pool to keep that from causing the type of boiling that you would see in, say, a pasta pot. You would never get that rolling boil at the surface of our reactor pool like you would there, just because there's so much water and so little reactor. If you were here to visit us today, you would... Uh, and you decided that you uh, really didn't want me to have a good day, you could swim down there and give the reactor a nice big hug. I would uh, never suggest that you do that. So if you do come and visit, um, don't tell them that I told you it would be okay. But the core is small enough that you could, uh, most people could fit their arms around the outside of the core. And because the pool is so deep, it has so much water in it. Uh, There's simply uh, not enough to be able to boil that water um, using the heat that's generated there. It's like using a candle to try to um, boil a pot of water. Very good.
the next things I want to talk about is what we're going to be doing next. So as I said before, um, something that was kind of important here is those beam ports. So in 1955, when the first reactor was put in, they put in beam ports to go along with that reactor. And there was actually seven beam ports in total. And here they are. Um, in 1998, they had changed the configuration of those beam ports so that the core would come in through the side. Um, the front of the core, the front of the uh, nuclear core in this photo is actually lined up um, vertically just to the right of uh, that center line. So you see where the core is and then the front of it is actually pointing to our left. And the two red uh, lines are the only ones that were capable of receiving those neutrons because the new core that was put in 1965 didn't line up properly with the beam ports that were installed in 1955. So to remedy that, in 2018, um, construction began here to change out the beam ports and make them more suitable for what we've been doing lately. So, see if I can zoom in on here. So, here is a picture of the um, new D2O tank, a new heavy water tank that's being put in. Uh, the old beam ports all had to be filled in and taken out, and five new beam ports were drilled into the wall to get those neutrons away into our neutron beam lab. So the new neutron beam lab looks more like this. So the core comes straight ahead, um, and we have actually five beam ports. The beam port to our far right uh, and the beam port straight on, which we call beam port number one and beam port number two, um, are kept, uh, are, are very similar and they're kept that way to support any kind of visiting researchers or changing projects that are happening. In the near future, we'll have a neutrino detector put in beam port one, uh, placed there by the Department of Physics. So not only are we supporting the engineering schools, but we're also supporting some very basic research. Uh, and that's uh, from the Department of Physics. They're, they're trying to detect neutrinos, which are massless uh, subatomic particles, which are very hard to detect, but uh, you can get a lot of them from our reactor core. Um, beam port three is set up to do an experiment we call transmission. Transmission is uh, what we, when we measure the amount of neutrons that can go through a particular type of material. In the nuclear industry, they will build alloys, create alloys to build things like um, fuel storage casks, fuel storage racks that go into pools, things that contain uh, used fuel and uh, transporting fuel those alloys have to absorb a certain percentage of neutrons. We test each one of those alloys in order to make sure that they are meeting their specs. Uh, we are one of many facilities in the country that can do it, but in order to do those tests, those, do those neutron tests, uh, you need to have a source of a lot of neutrons, which uh, happens to be our core. On the far left there is neutron beam port four. Um, that beam port four, is being used to take radiographs. Neutrons travel through materials a lot differently than x-rays do. When you go and get an x-ray from a doctor, uh, what you're looking to do is see through something that is pretty light, like your flesh or water, and get stopped by something that is really dense, like calcium and bone, or maybe metal. In order to sort of flip that, we can use 
the neutrons, which will travel through things like metal and lead and really heavy items, and then they'll get scattered or they'll get absorbed by really light materials like hydrogen and carbon. One of the uh, experiments that we've done with that in the recent past is um, research into the hydrogen fuel cell, where we'll take the hydrogen fuel cell, uh, which is a metal box, and take a radiograph of it so that we can see inside of the metal box and watch as the water molecules form um, and see how they travel through the channels. By knowing where the water molecules and where the water is flowing through the channels as it operates, the researchers can make adjustments to their design to make it a little bit more efficient. Have to switch over now. Oop. So, if you've been around campus recently or driving by, you'll notice that there is a um, lot of construction going on out in the back. And that construction is for this beam port that is second from the right. Uh, we call the cold source. Zach, we can't the see your source. screen. Oh, sorry. Here's what I'll do. All right, so back to the, the beam ports. So here, the cold source beam port has three guide tubes in it, and they'll go out to a device called the um, SANS, S-A-N-S, or Small Angular Neutron Scatterer. That comes out of this one on this side, uh, picture, it comes out from the second from the left. And that SANS equipment is being donated by a, a lab in Germany who no longer needs it. Um, <clears throat> we have done construction here at the, at the RSEC to increase the, uh, increase the length of the beam lab so that we can install that latest piece of equipment. And I'm hoping to be able to get you a picture of it. Here it is. So in the recent past, that beam lab has been basically to the edge here. And we've only been able to use two of these neutron beam ports. When that new SANS equipment gets put in, um, it will go way out into what used to be our parking lot um, into a new, new extension to the building in order to, um, to do this new research with the small angular neutron scatterers. At the front of the small angular neutron scatterers, there is is a source of, or there is liquid helium that will be cool the neutrons down to about 12 degrees uh, Kelvin. And because the neutrons are moving very slow and they have very low energies, we can actually see the moment that the neutron interacts with the target nucleus and be able to take measurements that we have never been able to take before. At this time, the extension onto the building, the expansion is just about complete. The SANS equipment has been taken apart and been stored into storage or into shipping containers. And we expect the first shipments of the SANS equipment to arrive sometime in the fall. All right. All right, so I'm going to switch over here a little, just for a bit. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to unmute or to put them into the chat. 
I'm sorry I haven't been able to um, monitor the chat as well as I would have with a with a second person here. It's just me here at the at the facility now. So uh, if you have any questions or anything you want to talk about, um, feel free to unmute and uh, and ask away. Zach, what do you do with the power that you generate? Is there any use provided for it, or do you just boil water? Excellent question. So we don't use the, the energy, the, the heat at all. If we could generate the neutrons uh, without generating any heat, that's what we would do, um, which is the, the exact opposite of a power plant, where if they could generate the heat without generating all of the radioactivity with it, um, they would choose to do that. We are here strictly as research facility, so all of that energy just goes into the water, doesn't boil it, doesn't turn it to steam, we don't have a turbine to, to run, um, all of it just goes into the water, so it makes the water just a little bit warmer. Um, even if we could, we had all the equipment to combine the, uh, or to encapsulate the reactor, and to make steam and turn it to the bottom, we want to be able to get too much energy. Our reactor here uh, is much different than a power reactor. So our fuel is pretty thick. At a power plant, the rods are really thin. And the reason for that is that they have more surface area to get that heat from the fuel into the water. We're not interested in that at all. Um, we have uh, thick fuel that's made of uranium and zirconium hydride. Um, that keeps the reactor, uh, that keeps pushing back on our power and keeps our reactor from overheating, um, even being capable of. If we were to leave all the water in the pool, we couldn't physically operate the reactor hot enough to cause any fuel damage. Um, the physical properties of that are just um, are designed in, in that scenario. So, just to put a button on that question, we cannot generate any electricity or any energy. Um, we don't use the, the heat for anything at all. Um, and even if we could, uh, it really wouldn't. And it's the licensing process would be more cumbersome to navigate the switch over than, uh, than it would be to take down the building and build a whole new reactor. Very good. I'm trying to keep my eye on the, the bulk of you guys. I can't tell who it is, but somebody's not on. Are there any other questions out there right now? Zach, we seem to be having problems with your audio. I don't know if it's something with your bandwidth, with your camera on, but it seems like you're okay. echoing. I'm not sure about that. Am I so it's still coming in, coming in twice? Yes. Do you have your, your headphones turned on, possibly? No, let's see if I can switch microphones. Now. Is this any better? Yes, that yeah. does sound better. Okay, excellent. All right, so I'm a little bit, now that I'm sitting sitting back down, uh, not using all the fancy equipment we got for all the, uh, all the virtual tours we've been doing. Uh, is anyone else out there? Anyone else out there got a question? Anything I can answer for you? Let's see what I got. So along the lines of those, um, along the lines of the... There's a couple of questions in chat. Oop. So let's see, what do I got? Welcome to We Are Weekend. 
1970, 1979. So here we go. Do you try? I think he's talking about the uh, do, you, do you try efficiency tests as opposed to a real nuclear facility doing it? In other words, does BSU do Chernobyl type testing? Um, so to Mike Edwards, uh, we don't, the, the type of test that Chernobyl was doing was a test with their, um, a test with their ability to generate electricity. And because we don't generate electricity, we don't do those tests. Um, they wanted to know if they had to shut down the reactor uh, if they could use the heat, use the, the heat that was still being generated um, to continue to turn their turbines and create electricity in order to run their pumps. Um, because we don't have any of that equipment, that's not something that we do here, um, but we do do a lot of research for the nuclear industry, um, including some of those testing that I talked about earlier. Um, as well as uh, testing for new styles of detectors or other instruments that will go into a nuclear core. Really, the only way to simulate a nuclear reactor core is to put it into a smaller nuclear reactor, which is exactly what we are. Zach, uh, are you going to talk about the uh, very strong negative Temperature coefficient of reactivity associated yes, I with the iridium becoming I absolutely can. Here, which allows you to pulse. Yes. So let me, let me pull that up for you. <clears throat> so I don't know if you see this at the very beginning here um, on this. I think I'm showing the right screen. Here we are. So at the very beginning of this, and I don't have, we are still seeing the video that starts with beam port number four. Yes. Let's try to, let's try to actually share all of that. At the very beginning of this, um, you see where it says Radiation Science and Engineering Center comes in? No, it's the picture of the building with a truck that was delivering the fuel. Oh, OK. So well, the question was, uh, So I'm going to talk about the very high temperature feedback of the of the reactor. Um, so the thing that's going on here is that whenever you try to push the reactor to its upper limit, um, what you end up getting is a very strong pushback of the reactor itself. So. If you remember from the reactor startup, we have four control rods. Three of them are followed by fuel. One of them is followed by air. For a reactor pulse, we take that last control rod that's followed by air and uh, we apply the pressure to it while the reactor is operating at a steady state. What happens is that that 80 pounds of pressure that pushes all of the boron out in that instant changes the reactor power from about 100 watts to about 200 million watts. And that happens in roughly a tenth of a second. The reason why it doesn't keep going and cause a 
excursion of reactivity or excursion of power that uh, causes a giant spike in heat and damages the reactor is because of those zirconium hydride molecules that are built in with the uranium fuel. In a typical power plant, you have what's called a moderator, which is the hydrogen that's built into the water that is in the coolant surrounding the reactor core. At Penn State, we have our moderator built into our fuel directly. How that works is that when a neutron gets shot out from the fission that happens inside of a uranium atom, that neutron is moving far too fast to cause another fission in another uranium atom. It must be slowed down. In order to slow it down, you have to bounce it off some other materials. At a power plant, they use the hydrogen that's in the water. At Penn State, we use the hydrogen that's in the water mole or in the zirconium hydride. Um, when, as, as the reactor heats up, that zirconium hydride also heats up and the hydrogen molecules start to vibrate inside of the molecules of zirconium. If the hydrogen atoms are moving really fast at a very high temperature, when the neutron comes and hits it, it's not going to slow down. It could even gain energy. At the peak of the pulse, when the reactor is operating at 200 gigawatts or two gigawatts, uh, the maximum amount of neutrons are in the core, but they're all moving much too fast to cause fission in the next generation. Therefore, what happens is that the reactor turns itself around and shuts itself back down. We are one of about a dozen reactors in the country that can do that. Uh, that can perform a pulse. Um, and lately we've used it pretty much just to show off. So whenever you see a pulse in, uh, at the reactor, what happens, you get a big flash of blue light. And that flash of blue light is the power, is the shrink off radiation that increases with power. Um, and that's the power being generated in the reactor changing in a split second and then shutting itself back down before we can do anything physically uh, or mechanically to, to change that. Very good. All right, so it's like a new question came in. How many students and faculty are involved with the reactor um, in reactor research? Right now, I think we have about 10 or 12 students that operate inside of, uh, inside of the RSEC. That number is about to increase because of our expansion. We're going to get a lot more students over here and also a lot more faculty. So right now there are two, maybe three faculty members who spend a lot of time over here. Um, but of course, as time goes, goes on, um, a lot of the research that gets done has eventually uh, comes through here. So some of the faculty are working on uh, very theoretical things where they're doing a lot of computer models, but anything that needs done with neutrons or gamma radiation uh, has to come through here. So right now I'm working with um, Department of Chemistry, one of the professors of chemistry um, are doing material research for gamma radiation and they need some materials um, exposed to gamma radiation um, and they, they come here to do it. Um, we have some other researchers on campus um, who are looking into uh, bee pollen um, and what's happening with the bees and how, what we can do to help save, um, help reduce the amount of uh, bees that are disappearing or are dying in mass. Um, and they've had uh, their bee pollen 
come here to be irradiated with gamma radiation to sterilize it. Uh, so it's the bee pollen doesn't make those bees sick. So the ones that they are researching uh, are doing that. We've had the same thing with caterpillars. Uh, they've come and uh, they've had uh, corn leaves that have been irradiated in order to keep the caterpillars from getting sick. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we tried to irradiate some uh, medical gowns and N95 masks uh, to see if we could reuse them um, because at the very beginning, the, the amount of masks um, were very low and the amount of gowns that were around were very low. Um, so we wanted to see if we could sterilize them and be able to reuse them again. Um, however, the radiation tends to make the masks and the gowns a little bit brittle. Um, so they don't work as efficiently. A N95 mask, once irradiated and once sterilized, um, doesn't work as efficiently and actually becomes an N30 mask. Uh, so that didn't quite work out, but thankfully we uh, worked up the uh, amount, of, uh, amount of mass being produced uh, in time. Zach, do you do any uh, irradiations for uh, industry or the commercial sector? Like yes, a lot of the commercial effects of electronics. Yeah, a lot of the commercial sector does um, those uh, radiations with the tr transmission. They do neutron testing. Um, some, uh, a lot of the another aspect of commercial radiations that we do a lot are with space. Um, space aspects, things that are going, going into satellites, uh, particularly electronics. So electronics can be damaged with the radiation that you are experiencing in space in, in orbit. Um, so to simulate that on Earth before these electronics get um, launched into orbit, they test those things here where we can use fast neutrons to simulate the kind of um, the kind of particle that you would get in space, the kind of fast moving, um, fast moving subatomic particles that you would be exposed to in orbit. We've also done some gamma radiations for NASA. Um, a few years ago, I was involved in a project where the people at NASA wanted to know just how deep they would need to drill into Europa before it was remotely possible for them to suck up any water with maybe some bacterial life uh, inside of it. So they wanted to simulate many millions of years of cosmic radiation at different depths in the ice um, on Europa. So we ended up going to four, we ended up going up to um, four megagrays of radiation, which simulated um, a very close to the surface um, amount of radiation that uh, these particular bacteria would get. Um, and what they found uh, was that you would have to, basically you would have to dig, drill pretty deep, is that the amount of radiation that we gave these things, um, uh, that we had to keep under liquid nitrogen the entire time, um, killed them pretty quickly. So anything that they would be able to find, they would have to drill fairly deep. We did something very similar, except for with the moon or the uh, planet Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt. Um, we wanted to know just how far they would need to dig on Ceres before they would find any kind of life. Um, and uh, we did that under uh, dry ice temperatures um, to simulate the environment, uh, the environment there. Very good, let me go. See if we can come back to some of the um, chat questions. What is covered in an in-person tour of the reactor that wasn't covered today? I think the main thing is that you get to put your eyes on the reactor core. To be able to see that in person, to see the Shrankoff radiation um, is something that doesn't really correspond well through video. You can watch many videos of it, but being able to see it in person really changes the way that you can experience um, what we have to offer here. It's like seeing videos of a sunset or a sunrise and then seeing it in person. Um, 
that would be the, the main difference between um, what you'd see here and what you'd uh, what you we covered today. Um, has Penn State made any scientific breakthroughs over the years? So one of the main thing or one of the things that we were certainly a pioneer of is something called neutron activation analysis. Uh, neutron activation analysis is when you make a material radioactive and then you count the radioactive emissions off of that material to find out what was in it. Um, so in, for example, um, if any of you, I saw some people back here saying they graduated in uh, late 70s. Um, if you remember Eisenhower Auditorium, pretty close to when it was first built, I think it was 1976. Um, they had moved a statue from Schwab Auditorium into Eisenhower Auditorium. That statue was uh, a draft of, a, of one called the Hewer, which is of a man throwing a discus um, with nothing but a very strategically placed fig leaf um, covering him up. Well, the art department wanted to know if that fig leaf was placed there by the original artist or if it was placed there later on to cover up the statue. So they took little scrapings of the statue of all the, all a few different places around the statue. And then of course one of the fig leaf and they put it into the reactor and counted the radiation that came off of it. That radiation corresponded to different types of elements in the fig leaf as it did the rest of the statue. And they were able to say definitively that the fig leaf was made of a plaster that was entirely different than the plaster that was originally used by the artist. Now, the art department went on in respect of the original artist to restore it to its original original um, condition and remove the fig leaf. And then because the fig leaf was removed and the statue was exposed, they couldn't leave it in Eisenhower Auditorium for much longer. So if, uh, if, you're, around, if you're around the area anytime and you're really interested, uh, this particular statue is on display at the Philatelic Society in Belfort. It, is, uh, it was made by a sculptor, um, Earl uh, Bernard Gray, who was a Belfusian, who donated the uh, statue, donated the draft of the statue to Penn State, which is why it was here. However, um, we, the, the powers that be decided that uh, the statue would not be able to be displayed in its full glory. And uh, that's kind of a a fun thing that, uh, that we helped out in, but um, some more serious items with that is that um, we've taken, um, we've taken non-radioactive materials and doped, um, doped different <laughs> facilities which run off into streams and rivers. And then we can take those, some samples a little bit downstream to see how much of that material that's being ejected out of these, uh, these plants get downstream. And by taking samples and irradiating them, making them radioactive, we can count just how much radioactivity or just how much pollution is coming from each of these plants that are generating pollution. Um, we also have done um, film kits. The original um, gun uh, gunshot residue kit was developed here at Penn State where they would take a piece of film and put it over the suspect um, pretty early on and then irradiate that film and they would compare the atomic, they would compare the elements that became radioactive in the film with the elements that you would expect to see from a gunshot and you would be able to tell uh, fairly definitively that a particular person shot a particular gun based on the trace elements that were found um, on each the host and, uh, and the controlled subject, the, 
the shooting we found. Um, now the chemical processes have gotten much better. We don't do much of that anymore. They, they figure out how to do other things. Um, but those are some of the, some of the uh, breakthroughs or things that have been developed here that um, you might have seen out and about. It's probably seen keep, CSI. Did someone keep the fig leaf? That's did something keep the fig leaf? I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not sure where, I'm not sure where the fig leaf is anymore. I know where the statue is, but they might have, uh, I don't know if removing it, they removed it um, in a manner that allowed them to keep it. Uh, let's see. What year was the nuclear facility built at PSU? Um, the construction started in 1953. The um, final, the the reactor went critical for the first time in 1955. Um, real quick, let's see if I can pull up this video again. So one of the things that we do. Um, so here we have, um, this is beam port four. This is where we take the neutron radiographs. Um, and here we are doing an experiment with a piece of metal that may or may not be from Amelia Earhart's final airplane. So researchers who have been researching Amelia Earhart, her last journey, where she may have crashed, uh, where she may be now, have come up with this piece of metal that was found somewhere in the Pacific Ocean um, that they think may have come from her aircraft. Um, and what we do here, and you can barely see it because it's in a dark room, um, <clears throat> but we have a cassette, which you see being set up on the right here, um, which has a digital film in it. And then a piece of metal that goes on the front. And that's what we're trying to take a picture of. So that isn't, isn't the piece of metal, but this is just a test. And what they do is they shoot a beam of neutrons through it. The neutrons will show up on the picture, a dark if it is something that is uh, light, like um, hydrogen or carbon. Uh, it'll show up light if it's something heavy, like some sort of metal. So this piece of metal will be transparent to the neutrons, but an old serial number that was painted on that has since washed away might be something that gets picked up. So here we are moving the reactor against the D2O tank, against the beam ports in order to do this experiment in the top beam port there. Um, we start up the reactor, open up the shutter, which will allow the neutrons to get through, close the shutter, bring the um, cassette out, and we can read it using this program here. So we have a, what's we call a CRX flex, uh, which reads the digital um, output um, and shows the image on the screen. Now I can't show you the images yet um, because they did, I can tell you that they did see something um, but we do, don't have any definitive um, answers about this, whether or not it was in fact from Amelia Earhart's airplane. So they're also doing the neutron activation analysis to compare the trace materials, the trace elements from um, that, um, one minute left, um, the trace materials from that to something else. Um, the reactor is on East Campus, so uh, I can bring up the aerial view again. Um, I might not have the time to do it. Do you all do any uh, research in support of uh, medical isotopes? Um, there is some medical isotopes that are being researched here. Um, this is uh, University Drive here in the center of your screen um, and the exchange for, uh, with uh, College Avenue running right to left and um, 
kind of university drive going kind of up and down. And we're up here in the top right hand corner. Um, so if you right off a of Heister Road um, uh, and Bigler, um, that's where we're located. Uh, there is some um, research coming down the pike uh, with some boron capture therapy where you inject boron into a tumor and then uh, irradiate it with neutrons. Those neutrons will interact with the boron, uh, create a uh, pair of uh, a alpha particle and lithium pair, which would uh, alpha particles don't travel very far. So if you inject it into a tumor, the idea is that they don't travel very far, but they kill a lot of the tumor cells as they go through. Um, and there's also some research into some hafnium, um, hafnium isotopes, which can be used in medical as well. Um, there was a question that came pre-recording or pre-presentation um, about uh, small modular reactors. The department just entered into an agreement with Westinghouse, uh, Westinghouse Nuclear Company, which is based in Pittsburgh, and we've had a very good relationship with them over the years. Their small modular design uh, is they plan on building a prototype of that at Penn State on the University Park campus. One, to provide energy for the campus, and two, to provide an opportunity for students to learn how to operate the reactor um, and how the, the power reactors work. Um, that just got started. We, there's no time frame. Um, the reactor design has not been approved yet, but the first steps have been taken um, in order to get that, uh, that, get that going here at University Park. That can be for uh, process heat as well as electricity? Yes, um, I just had a meeting where I just had a tour with the uh, steam steam services, um, where they believe that if everything works out and they can operate this reactor basically twenty four seven, um, is that it it would be able to generate enough electricity that they convert all of the heat into electricity. So they wouldn't need. They wouldn't need the process heat anymore. They wouldn't need steam um, if they ran, if they converted everything to electrical heat, um, they would have plenty of electricity from this one small modular reactor. Now, the- but They're still gonna have waste heat and that can be used for process heat. They, it could be, um, but they don't, they don't foresee that, at least at this point, and this is, again, it's very early on, uh, they don't foresee that being uh, being the future, rather than using steam across uh, campus as they've had pretty much since the beginning. Um, they're looking at using electricity uh, as a main source of both heat um, and energy throughout the campus. But that again can, can change pretty drastically, uh, depending on exactly how they plan on using this uh, SMR. I've gone four minutes over time now. Um, if you would like to get a hold of me, my, you can go to rsec.psu.edu and my picture and my email address is right there on the front page. Um, feel free to shoot me any questions, anything that you wanna know. If you would like to schedule an in-person tour, if you just couldn't make it here to the facility today and can at some other time, um, please shout out and uh, we can schedule a time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for um, bearing with me through all the technical problems that, you know, I thought I had worked out throughout the day, but here, yet here we are back in uh, doing the same things all over again. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to our hosts and uh, to Nicole for being our captioner. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you again. Thank you.